Hi, we're going to start our study of the digestive system with this first Ed puzzle. So when we look at the digestive system, we need to review a couple of terms because the digestive system, as you know, is taking in food and breaking it down and eliminating the waste. And so there's two processes here, anabolism or anabolic and catabolism or catabolic. So anabolic or anabolism, you remember, I'm sure, that you take smaller molecules and you put them together to make bigger molecules. So maybe you take amino acids and combine them to make a protein. That's anabolic. And our cells are going to be doing this. Whereas catabolic is taking the large molecule and breaking it down into smaller components. So when we take in maybe starch or protein or lipids, we take them in our digestive system's job is to break them down into small molecules so they can be absorbed into our blood. And then they travel to all cells of the body. The cells will use those molecules to generate ATP or they will use them to build larger molecules that the cell might need. And so these two processes are happening constantly in the body. We will talk more about the ATP component when we study our next chapter next week, we'll review some of that. So these are processes that are occurring in the body. Now, when we look at the digestive system, we need to talk about the organs. So we have what's called the GI tract or alimentary canal, and you can see it here. So the GI tract is a long, smooth muscle tube, and it starts in your mouth, which is known as your oral cavity. And if we follow this tube, if we eat food, because the GI tract are all the organs that food passes through, it'll go from your mouth to your oral pharynx, down your laryngopharynx, esophagus, stomach, through the small intestine, now the large intestine and out the anus. So it's one continuous smooth muscle too. Theoretically, you could take a 30 foot long piece of dental floss and swallow it. And if it comes out the other end, you could floss your whole tract. It's that continuous. Anything that comes in your mouth is going to leave out the anus in feces um, unless you absorb it. And when we absorb it, as we look at those processes, that means we're moving it from the GI tract, from these organs into your bloodstream. You've seen this, you know, happen, right? We know there's stuff we eat that we don't absorb that basically comes out the other end. If you've had corn or if you have children and they've ever swallowed a crayon, then you've seen this firsthand. Now, the accessory organs are important for digestion, but food does not pass through them. So accessory organs are things like salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And so these are important and we'll be discussing their importance in later lectures. But if you look at the accessory organs, you can live without your gallbladder, but you cannot live without a liver or a pancreas. So we just go over functions, obviously ingestion, take food in. We have an oral cavity, a mouth, teeth, so that we can take food in and we can start to break it all down. Our digestive system does secretion. So there's all sorts of things secreted. There's hormones and acids and enzymes and buffers. So when we talk about secretion, a lot of times these things are just called juices. Now I'm warning you, I'm having some pen issues right now. So we will see how this works, but we'll call different juice like gastric juice, right? Intestinal juice. It also has to move the food through, right? As it's breaking it down, it sends it through. So it's going to have smooth muscle. So it's going to, to push it through or propulsion. Motility, when you hear motility, we're talking about how fast the food is moving through it. And so there's two main ways it does this. There's something called peristalsis. So all organs of the GI tract use peristalsis. Peristalsis is, is basically a smooth muscle wave-like contraction. So you can see it's like a wave and it just kind of pushes the food or the material through. Um, and you'll have like regular wave-like contractions pushing it all the way through that particular segment. Segmentation is more like pieces of it contract and sometimes it can kind of work back and forth a little bit. So it's more like small little pieces are contracting. I kind of think of segmentation as when you have like a long tube of toothpaste and somebody grabbed it in the middle and then you take it and you kind of like push it and, and work it all the way through so you can move the toothpaste to the end. So peristalsis, all GI organs do it. Segmentation, primarily the small intestine.
we obviously have digestion. So when we look at digestion, there's two types. There's mechanical. Mechanical is physically breaking it down. So when our teeth chew our food, you can see it breaks it down. Or when we have um, churning in our stomach, right? Our stomach contractions are so strong, we hear them when your stomach growls. So mechanical digestion, I want you to know mouth and stomach. Chemical digestion is using enzymes. So chemical digestion, we know enzymes are proteins and they're specific, right? They're going to break chemical bonds. And chemical digestion primarily happens in the small intestine. A little bit of it happens in your mouth, a little bit in your stomach, but the majority of it is the small intestine. And most of the enzymes for chemical digestion actually come from your pancreas. Once we break it down, right, once we have the big molecule and we break it into smaller, now we absorb it. So remember, absorption means that the, those nutrients, those smaller pieces, are going to leave the GI tract and enter either the blood or the lymph. You might remember that lipid or fat is going to enter your lymph. In fact, this was called a lacteal. That was a special lymphatic capillary. And again, I told you my pen is not cooperating. So it's L-A-C-T-E-A-L. I will have it fixed by the next lecture. Um, and that absorbs the fat, whereas other materials enter the blood. And then anything that's not absorbed, as I mentioned, is going to be lost as defecation. So this is how we're getting rid of the waste products. Now we have to review the peritoneum or peritoneum. So we have this giant peritoneal cavity, right? We have visceral and parietal peritoneum. The visceral peritoneum is actually going to attach to the organ. So every organ you see here is going to have visceral peritoneum surrounding and attaching to it. The parietal is this big one out here. Remember, it lines the whole cavity. So this one has a really large parietal peritoneum. Each organ has its own visceral. And then all the kind of like blue is the cavity. And that cavity contains peritoneal fluid. And there's a lot of fluid in here. So peritonitis would be some sort of infection um, inside the cavity. So this could happen from an outside source. So, you know, maybe there's some um, wound, like stab wound or gunshot or opening from the outside, then that could introduce bacteria in. Another way it could happen from the inside is maybe you have a blocked intestine. Um, maybe you have a burst appendix. So you can get peritonitis from internally or from externally. And you might have heard of ascites before. It's called third spacing. So here's my normal abdomen. Look what happens with ascites. So it's an increase in peritoneal fluid, right? It's edema in your abdomen, basically. We've talked about sources of edema before. We know that if we should lower our osmotic pressure. So if we don't have enough albumin, we would expect that to cause a problem. So again, anytime my osmotic pressure should fall, and we know that one of the main components of osmotic pressure was albumin. So that could definitely do that, which is also why we look at liver disease. Um, also though, remember that hydrostatic pressure plays a role here. So if my hydrostatic pressure were to go up, that could force more materials out. So this could happen with an obstruction in a vein because the pressure would go up. In heart failure, the fluids back up, so it could cause more pressure in the abdomen. And then there's other things like inflammation. We know always causes edema because it releases the histamine and heparin and makes the vessels more permeable. So these are all things that could cause ascites or third spacing. And a lot of times they'll just go in and they'll pull out all that fluid. You know, you can have liters and liters of fluid removed here. And then we have things called mesenteries. And mesenteries are like connective tissue, basically. They're fatty connective tissue. And they kind of help hold everything together. So their passageways are blood and nerve and lymph. And there's two special ones. They're called the lesser and greater omentum. Omentum is uh, Latin for apron. So the lesser omentum is up here, this little like yellowish thing. Notice it helps connect and support the liver to the stomach. 
And then this huge thing here is the greater omentum. And on one of our lab models, you'll see it a little bit of it. And then they cut it away to see what's below it. But the greater omentum is the really big one. And notice that helps connect the stomach to the large and small intestines. And if you ever hear retroperitoneal or retroperitoneal organs, these are organs that are technically behind the peritoneal cavity. And the best example is the kidneys. So we need to talk about blood vessels real quick. So it's called splanic circulation, and we'll be looking at it for our next practical. But we know that if we look at the abdominal aorta, that there are branches that come off it. And so when we look in lab, we'll see the diaphragm up here. And the very first branch is called the celiac trunk. Now you can call it the celiac artery. We usually call it the celiac trunk. Well, the celiac trunk has three branches that come off it. So it has three branches. The first one's called the left gastric going to the stomach. It has a splenic coming down to the spleen, and then it has a hepatic, and we usually call this the common hepatic artery. So these are the three branches off the celiac. The common hepatic will then split into a right and left hepatic artery. Um, notice the stomach, left gastric goes to the stomach, and there's also a right gastric that we'll see on the models. It just does not come off of the celiac. And then we also have the splenic. Now the other ones are the superior and inferior mesenteric vessels. So again, they come right off the aorta. The superior mesenteric is going to supply parts of the pancreas and small intestine, and the inferior is going to supply most of the large intestine. So we'll be looking at these in class. Now, when we're looking at the liver, it has its own circulation. It has a special vein called the hepatic portal vein. And notice that the, the blood that's drained from the stomach, so the gastric veins, the splenic vein, your pancreatic veins, your mesenteric veins, all of those veins, they don't go to the vena cava like we looked already when we looked at blood flow. They all go to the hepatic portal vein first. So this vein picks up all venous blood right? All um, O2 poor blood, nutrient rich blood, right? It's coming from the small intestine, full of nutrients that you just absorbed. It goes to the liver for processing first. When the liver processes it, it runs through the liver and then it leaves through the hepatic veins. So when you're trying to find this on the models, the hepatic artery, so the common hepatic splits into right and left, and that will enter the inferior portion of the liver. And you'll see a big blue thing on some models, it's pink or purple. That's a hepatic portal vein. So that comes in the inferior. The hepatic veins are on the superior portion of the model. So you'll see that in lab. As far as control, right? We're under control of the autonomic nervous system as well as the enteric nervous system. So we'll be coming back to this. Real fast overview, autonomic nervous system. Remember, it's only efferent. And this is where we have our sympathetic and our parasympathetic divisions, so the ANS. If we're looking at the sympathetic, we're looking at norepinephrine. If we're looking at the parasympathetic, we're looking at acetylcholine. And we'll come back to more details shortly. The enteric nervous system only innervates digestive organs, and most of it's in the digestive system itself. So the ENS is like the, the brain of the gut or the, the nerves of the gut. And so there's lots of enteric nerves, and they are very, very important in coordinating all of your digestive activities, digestion, secretion. And when we look at the ENS, the primary neurotransmitter here is actually serotonin, which um, we had in AMP1. So I apologize, I'm using my mouse, <laughs> serotonin. And so that is the main... Um, neurotransmitter for your gut and for your ENS. So let's look at the tunic. So when we looked at blood vessels, you learned three, there's four for the GI tract. They're called the mucosa. That's the innermost one. So that comes right in contact with the food, it surrounds the lumen. Below that is the sub mucosa, sub means below. Then we have all the muscle, smooth muscle. And then we have the, out, the outside, the serosa, which basically anchors it to the surrounding structure. So let's look at the mucosa first. So the lining, 
So we can have epithelial tissue. Remember, epithelial covers and lines everything. And as we go through the organs, we'll talk specifically about what kind of you know epithelial tissue it is. There are some special cells. They're called enteroendocrine cells. They're in this layer, and they're going to secrete hormones because technically, you know, your small intestine is not an endocrine organ, but it does make hormones. Remember, the lamina is always the connective tissue underneath that has the blood supply, and there's some lymph, and this is going to line the entire cavity from your mouth to your anus. Remember, it's one continuous lining. So if we look at this inner lining, um, one thing we'll notice, it's often see these folds here. These are called plica. And what the plica do is really two things. They force the food to spiral through and it kind of, as it spirals through, it's going to help it mix with all the different secretions, um, which is really helpful. So these plica circularis or plica. And then, you know, this is the inner lining. So here's a chunk of it. You can see the mucosa and some of the plica. Here's the submucosa and the muscle and the serosa. But notice that the blood and lymph are here. So this is where all absorption happens. So anything that's moving from that lumen, trying to get into your blood or lymph, it has to pass through that mucosa layer of epithelial cells. This is where secretion happens. There's lots of glands that are going to secrete the juices and enzymes. And it also protects us. Because remember, technically, if there is something that's inside your GI tract, so I'm just gonna do X. If it stays there, it won't hurt you because it's just going to come out the other end, right? But if it goes through this layer, now it gets in you, so now it can hurt you. So pathogens, right? Um, if they get through this layer, they get in your blood. A lot of times if we have like gastritis or a viral infection or what your, your GI system does, what your digestive system does is it causes vomiting or diarrhea because what it's trying to do is just get that pathogen through as quickly as possible so it can go in and basically out. Now the submucosa is below the mucosa. It's dense or regular connective tissue. There is a nerve plexus. We don't talk about this one too much, but it does have some branches of your ENS and ANS. But the main player we're gonna look at is the one out here in the muscularis. So this is muscle, this is smooth muscle. This is where all the segmentation occurs and the peristalsis. It is smooth muscle, so it doesn't look striated, but understand it still has myosin and actin and sarcomeres. It has pacemaker cells, just like the heart. It has cells that depolarize all on their own. They're going to have gap junctions. It has circular layers that form what's called a sphincter. So a sphincter can open or close, and they're usually found at junctions between organs. So if they're closed, the material, the food cannot enter the next organ, and the, when they're open, it allows that food to move. It has your ENS and your ANS, so really going to be effective here. And then the plexus is called the myenteric plexus. So this is a nerve plexus, it's going to be found in the muscularis, and it's the primary one we look at. So this is going to have my ANS and my ENS. So we already said that the ANS is going to have parasympathetic and sympathetic. When we look at the ANS, when we look at parasympathetic, remember the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And see if you remember the receptor. The receptor is going to be your muscarinic receptor pretty much the main ones that we've studied. And it's very slow for me to write with the mouse. Now we look at the sympathetic. Remember that the sympathetic is going to have norepinephrine. And you might remember that the receptor in smooth muscle is the alpha one. So when we release acetylcholine, oh, I did not know it was going to do that, I apologize. I am not going to take 10 minutes to rewrite it. When we release acetylcholine, we know that it binds to a muscarinic receptor and it enhances digestion. So it will increase what we call motility. We know that norepinephrine, on the other hand, is going to slow things down. It's going to close sphincters. So these two are going to control digestion. As I mentioned, serotonin is the main neurotransmitter for the ENS. And serotonin is usually excitatory. Now, the serosa is just the outer layer. It basically just helps protect it. It helps anchor it to other um, organs in the area. So it's mainly like a structural support. 
So when we look at the control, what we're going to be doing is going through the organs. And as we go through the organs, I'll talk about the anatomy. We will talk about the gross anatomy first, then the microscopic anatomy. And then we will talk about the function of that organ and what controls it. Because the control of your digestive organs comes from three places. We're going to have neural. So we've already talked about we're going to have our we basically are going to have our CNS. Your brain is involved, right? It's called a long reflex because it takes a little longer to get from your brain down to the myenteric plexus. So my CNS would include my ANS, autonomic nervous system. We know the ENS, right? The nervous system of the gut. So that would be, you know, more of a short term. That's a, that's a quicker reflex. So we'll be talking about both of those, sympathetic, parasympathetic, enteric. We know hormones are involved. There's lots of hormones that come back. So there's over 18 hormones. Um, relax, we're not learning all 18 hormones. A lot of them are made by those cells I mentioned called enteroendocrine cells that are in the mucosa. And then we'll talk about local factors. And this differs for the organ. This could be the pH in the area. This could be if it's stretched or not. This could be histamine. You know, we talked about histamine with inflammation, but histamine also controls the amount of hydrochloric acid released by your stomach. So as we go through the organs, we'll be talking about these factors and how they control the functioning of that organ. So this picture is a little blurry, but I think it does a nice job of showing you some of the hormones that we'll be looking at. You might remember these from AMP1. We have some that come from the stomach. We have a lot that come from the small intestine, and we have some that also come from the pancreas. And then remember when we look at local factors, there's things called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are hormone-like molecules. The difference is they don't travel through the blood. They work at the site of release. Histamine I mentioned already, and there's other chemicals. Or we look, as I said, at changes in pH or physical stimuli, such as stretching, or even other chemical stimuli we'll look at, such as caffeine. So this concludes our lecture on the introduction to the digestive system.